Hello everyone. Today we are going to discuss a very interesting topic that is the learning and memory. We are discussing in our higher functions in the CNS lectures under which learning and memory will be discussed today. Learning and memory will be discussed under these subheadings that is the what is learning and memory and what are the various different classifications of memory and what is the neuronal basis of memory and finally an important disorder which is related to memory loss that is the Alzheimer's disease. Now let's get into the topic. So what is learning? Learning is nothing but the acquisition of knowledge. Suppose you read something and try to acquire some knowledge, it is called as learning. Then what is memory? You are able to encode this learning process and store it in your brain and finally you are able to retrieve it. For example, you read something today and you appear for an exam. So whenever you read something, what happens is it is getting encoded and stored in the brain. And finally, if you are able to retrieve it and reproduce it in the examination, that is called as the memory part. So learning is just the acquisition of knowledge, the other retrieval, storage and encoding of memory is called as encoding of learning process is called as the memory. Now coming to the classification of memory. Memory class can be classified into various different types based on their duration as well as the different forms of memory. We will start with the simplest one that is classification of memory based on the duration. Based on the duration, memory can be classified into short term memory, intermediate memory and long term memory. So short term memory as the term indicates it is going to last for a very few seconds to minutes whereas intermediate it is last going to last for minutes, hours or days. Whereas long term memory sometimes it can last till lifelong also. It can last for days, weeks or years together. So these are the different types of memory based on the duration. And there is one more term which is called as the working memory. This working memory is a part of a short term memory itself. And it is especially done with the help of a prefrontal cortex. This prefrontal cortex is very very essential for working memory. In our cognition class also we saw whenever there is an injury to the prefrontal cortex, the working memory for the person is not able to do. And what is the example for it? Suppose in our childhood, whenever our mother says to buy something, we always keep on repeating it till we tell it to the shopkeeper. So that is a form of working memory. Another very good example is OTP. Suppose whenever an OTP arrives during our transaction, we tend to remember that number. What we do? We keep on repeating the number until we put the details in the phone. So this process is called as the working memory, which is a part of a short term memory. You remember that information till it is traveling in your brain. Once you enter the OTP, you will definitely forget the OTP. Nobody can remember what is the OTP we have entered today morning also. Now coming to the process of consolidation. What is consolidation? Whenever the short term memory or the intermediate memory is consolidated to a long term memory or stored into a long term memory, it is called as consolidation. And there is one important region in the brain which is involved in this consolidation. And what is the region involved? It is nothing but our hippocampus. This hippocampus is very very essential for this consolidation process. Now coming to the other classification which is classified based on the forms of memory. There are two different forms of memory. One is called as the explicit memory, another one is called as the implicit memory. Let's try to understand what are they. So coming to explicit memory, it is also called declarative memory. What do you understand by declarative memory? For this memory process to happen, you have to think and take it from your memory and it takes a few minutes, a few seconds or few minutes to retrieve the information. This type of memory is called as declarative memory where you have to be consciously aware of what is the question and you have to respond. And it is further classified into episodic and semantic. So what is episodic? So it is like a, a web series only like episode. So episode is a series of events which comes one after the other. For example, you are able to remember whatever has happened in your last birthday starting from the day you have started and you wore your new clothes and you celebrated along with your friends by cutting cake and everything. So this series of events, this series of episodes, you should be able to try to recall it. You cannot blast it out in a second, but once you recall it, it comes to your memory. So you have to recall it in a conscious manner. So this type of memory is called as episodic memory and this episodic memory is for the events. And for this, two regions in the brain are very, very essential. One is the hippocampus, another one is the neocortex. Then coming to the other form of memory, which is also a form of declarative memory, it is called as semantic memory. This semantic memory is very, very essential for the facts. For example, I ask you, what is Frank Starling's law? What you will do? You will just think first and then you will answer it. 
सो दिस टाइप ऑफ फैक्ट विच आर स्टोर्ड इन द ब्रेन और कॉल एज सेमेंटिक मेमरी फॉर दिस यू नीड कॉन्शियसनेस डेफिनेटली दिस area which is involved in semantic memory is prefrontal cortex then coming to the implicit memory or non declarative memory here it says it's non declarative it means that you don't need much of your awareness don't think that it is uh, done unconsciously hey, you need a little bit of consciousness but you don't need much of an awareness that is required for an explicit memory it does not read awareness and coming to the implicit memory they are divided into various forms the most important ones are the procedural then priming associative learning and non associative learning so all these are very very important so coming to the procedural as the term indicates suppose whenever you do a procedure initially you will find it very difficult initially it will be an explicit form of memory but as and when you do it for a longer duration what happens it will be practice and you will be doing it without much of awareness what is an example the best example is driving a car so initial part of learning takes a little difficulty which is an explicit memory but once you are practiced what will happen sometimes you drive from point a to point b without even knowing that you have reached that point finally you will reach the point you will not remember anything that is happening in between them so that type of procedural memory goes into an implicit memory after a long period of practice so the areas involved in the brain are striatum cerebellum and motor cortex motor cortex obviously you need for learning a procedure now coming to an interesting form of memory which is priming this is very interesting i'll give you some examples then you will understand what is priming so this priming memory is done with the help of neocortex so coming to the examples in the movie inception also there is one beautiful example given what leonardo dicaprio will say is don't think of an elephant so whenever a person is hearing about the term elephant even though we say it is don't think of an elephant what we said to do we tend to start thinking about an elephant and an elephant image comes into your brain so if somebody is able to prime the other person and bring out some memory out of him it is called as priming memory let's see some more beautiful examples i'll give you two examples so blue red and if i write gr and dash 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 what is your answer here most of you will answer it very rightly and it is green now coming to another example i'll give you another example wherein i write apple orange and gr dash 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 what is your answer now for the same gr dash 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 you are not going to answer it green in the second state statement i have primed you with fruits so obviously our brain will be tending to think to access and fruit and fit into this image here so what is the answer here it is g r a p e so what i have done here i have just primed you with some prior knowledge so your brain is going to act and give the responses depending upon this prior information if i tell you about colors the same gr becomes green and with if i tell you about fruits the same gr dash 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 becomes grape so these are the priming forms of memory so now coming to associative learning in associative learning the brain relates to some association and learns from it in this there are two components one is the emotional component which is done with the help of amygdala all of us know that amygdala is the part for an emotion then coming to the second part that is the skeletal part which is under the control of the cerebellum and one of the best example for this is the pavlos experiment all of us know this experiment in this what they do they initially ring a bell and then give the food and the dog starts to salivate they keep on doing it for multiple times and finally whenever they ring the bell even without the food the dog is going to salivate so how does this happening here the dog has associated the arrival of food or giving of food with that of the bell so this type of learning process is called as associative learning now finally what happens even without giving a food when you ring the bell the particular dog is going to salivate because of its close association with that of the food now coming to non associative learning which is also a form of implicit memory here these are the reflex pathways it is generally classified into two things one is the habituation and sensitization i'll give you some examples so that you can understand what is habituation so the best example for this is suppose a friend of you is living by a train track for a very long years so as and when the train is passing initial few days he will be finding it very difficult to sleep but after that what will happen the people who reside in the uh, by the side of the train track they get habituated to the stimulus now their brain ignores that the train passing sound 
How, why does this it's essential? Because always our brain wants to pay more attention to an essential thing. It wants to cut off the noise. For example, we are wearing a shirt. When we wear it, we always feel that we are wearing it. After that, we don't think of that there is a shirt on me and I am sitting on a chair. Because these are non-essential stimuluses that should not stimulate my brain constantly. Otherwise, we will not be able to concentrate more on the important stimuluses. Best example for habituation is sound of the train getting habituated for the people living nearby. Now coming to sensitization, what is sensitization? Sensitization is the opposite of habituation. Here, the person will have a heightened response or a heightened awareness for a particular stimulus. I will give you one example. If you are bitten by a dog, then what will happen? Every time you see a dog, you always have the fear in the brain and you will have an increased awareness to the same stimulus. If your friend is not bitten, he will not have that much of an awareness whenever he is passing across a dog. And another good example is the cry of the baby will always stimulate the mother. The mother gets the first alarm that whenever a baby is crying because the cry of the baby creates a form of sensitization in the mother and the mother is always having a heightened awareness for that particular stimuli. So you see these are the two examples for a sensitization process. So the examples for sensitization are mother's response to the cry of the baby and increased awareness for an individual if he is bitten by a dog or any harmful stimulus. Now coming to the neuronal basis of memory. All of us know that whenever we are constantly learning something, what will happen? Our brain or tends to memorize it for a longer duration. So that is why we keep on repeating that repeated revision for the exams is very, very essential because you keep on studying the same thing again and again, your brain is going to store it for a much longer duration. So how does this happen? This happens with the help of two processes, which is called as post tetanic potentiation and long term potentiation. In a similar manner, if you don't study a subject for a very long time, what will happen? There can be long-term depression also. So the particular circuit in the brain, it is going to be depressed. This is, this is probably because of the plasticity of the brain. Our brain can modulate its synaptic connections through a process called as plasticity. So coming to the first process, that is called as a post-tetanic potential. What happens in post-tetanic potential? This happens for a shorter period. You are giving a repeated stimulus. You keep on reading the same chapter again and again and you are repeating in your brain. So what will happen? This postsynaptic potentiation, there is an increased stimulus to the presynaptic terminal. And this presynaptic terminal will increase the neurotransmitter release from the synapse to the synapse. And the postsynaptic terminal, what it is going to do is, it is going to keep the channels open for a longer time. So now the neurotransmitter is more available more and as well as the channels are open for a longer time. So what is the advantage? The synaptic connections can be stimulated much easier. And coming to the second process which is very very important that is called as the long term potentiation. This long term potentiation happens due to several changes in the presynaptic as well as the postsynaptic terminal. So let's see what happens in the presynaptic and postsynaptic terminal. So in the presynaptic terminal there is a neurotransmitter, excitatory neurotransmitter called glutamate this G indicates the glutamate is present. So whenever there is an impulse arriving in the presynaptic terminal, what is going to happen? This glutamate is going to be released. In the postsynaptic terminal, there are two important receptors. The first receptor is called as the NMDA receptor and the second one is called as the AMPAR receptor. Out of this, NMDA is an important receptor, but it always needs the help of an AMPA. Let's see what happens. Because naturally, what happens in this NMDA receptor, it is always blocked by a, so basically it is kept blocked by a ion which is called as magnesium. It is kept blocked by magnesium. Even though this is a more efficient channel and more amount of neurotransmitter can enter through this channel, but still it is blocked by the magnesium. So it needs the help of his friend which is called as the AMPA channel. This AMPA channel is the one which helps it. So what happens whenever glutamate is released, this glutamate will increase the entry of sodium inside the postsynaptic terminal. And this entry of sodium, what it can do is, it can dislodge the magnesium from the NMDA receptor. Now magnesium is thrown away, so what will happen? There will be opening of the NMDA receptor. And this opening of the NMDA receptor can allow loads of sodium as well as the calcium. And finally, there will be a calcium called calmodulin complex and finally the signal transduction will happen and this will help in the storage of the memory. And there is one more important neurotransmitter which is involved in retrograde messenger. That neurotransmitter is called as nitric oxide. 
this nitric oxide this no is called as nitric oxide what does it do is it sends impulses and increases the synaptic presynaptic release so that's why it is called as retrograde messenger so it is sending the impulses back to the presynaptic terminal so these are the processes which are normally happening so what is long term potentiation in long term potentiation what happens is there is an increased amount of neurotransmitters in the particular connections if you are studying constantly about a particular subject what will happen there will be an increased amount of presynaptic neurotransmitter so that is an advantage second thing what happens is there is an increased amount of ampa as well as the nmda receptor itself if the receptors are high it is going to increase the connections faster so it is going to help me retain it for a longer duration third thing is the neutral retrograde neurotransmitter is also going to increase so all these events as well as the genetic components which are happening in this circuit they are also enhanced the enzyme activity as well as the genetic nature of this particular connection is going to be enhanced so whenever you see a single line from that chapter you are going to remember about the entire chapter so this is how the long term potentiation is happening when all these processes reverse whereas the decrease in neurotransmitter decrease in the receptor levels all this reverses that is called as long term depression how does a long term depression happens if you don't keep the circuit active then it is going to go in for a depression that's why for brain we use a particular term called as use it or lose it as long you as long as you use the brain activity it is going to stay healthier once you stop reducing the activity what is going to happen there is going to be a long term depression in the brain and there is going to be a loss of synaptic connections for that particular kind of activity now coming to an important clinical disorder which is because of memory loss that disease is called as the alzheimer's disease what happens in this disease is there is neurodegeneration there is degeneration of neurons which happens in this particular disease because of which there is loss of episodic memory first initially there will be a loss of any episodic memory they they will not be able to recall the memories of their past they cannot they cannot recall what happened uh, during their wedding or what happened during their college time they will not be able to remember anything there is one beautiful movie for uh, for us to understand this alzheimer's disease which is called as a notebook there is a movie as well as a book i suggest all of you to watch this in that what happens is the heroine or the main character she forgets all about the past and the hero tries to induce her and try to remember their previous memories from the past so this is a very uh, devastating disease what happens is initially there will be loss of episodic memory but later on there can be a complete loss of cognitive functions so it becomes very difficult for the person with alzheimer's disease to carry out their day to day activities also so this is a very severe form of disease and very dangerous form of disease so what are the risk factors the risk factors are there is a pro genetic protein called as presenilin 1 and 2 that is one risk factor and down syndrome nowadays there has been studies saying that people who lack adequate sleep they also end up landing in alzheimer's disease at a much earlier age so it is always suggested to have a good amount of sleep because there is accumulation of lot of unwanted materials in the brain which can be thrown out during sleep in our sleep series also we have seen that sleep is very very essential for the human in this alzheimer's disease there are two cytopathological hallmarks one is the hyperphosphorylation of the tau proteins there is a specific form of tau proteins which gets hyperphosphorylated and it gets deposited in the brain so this will strong uh, stop the long term potentiation activity and there are amyloid plaques also these plaques can be usually removed during sleep and if the person is having insomnia what will happen there will be deposition of this amyloid plaques so what is the treatment for alzheimer's disease first treatment is to prevent it from happening so we should keep our brain active as much as possible for treatment there is a good amount of drugs which is called as acetylcholine esterase inhibitors what are the name of the drugs the name of the drugs are galantamine and rivastigmine there are a numerous group of drugs which we will study in pharmacology but these are the two most important group of drugs i hope it's clear thank you for watching the video if you like my content subscribe to the channel and share it with your friends thank you so much